This video is sponsored by Surfshark. <laughs> My name's Ed Pratt, and from March 2015 to July 2018, I pedaled a unicycle 22,000 miles around the world. Over that time, I crossed four continents, Europe, Asia, Australia, and North America, and performed over 12 million pedal rotations on my 40 kilogram fixed gear, 36 inch touring unicycle. When I finally returned home after three years on the road, I became the first person ever to officially ride a unicycle around the world. But actually, that last bit's not true. Let me explain. Okay, so to tell the story properly, we need to go back a year before I started the world ride. I was 18, attending sixth form college and studying for my A-levels. A year before, I'd got into unicycling in quite a big way. Go ahead. I learned to ride on a tiny 16-inch unicycle. I soon upgraded to a 29er and then finally bought myself a 36er. These unicycles have the largest commercially available wheels with pneumatic tires. A larger wheel means an effective higher gear Hence why these are the cycles of choice for distance riders. I did mess around with some off-road unicycling during this time too, with varying success. But my interest really lay in distance riding. In this final year of sixth form, I started to consider exactly what I wanted to do after school was over. The obvious decision would have been to just go to university. It certainly would have been the sensible choice, plus all my mates were going, but honestly, I really didn't think I could face another three years of studying. So I thought about what other options I had. It was during this time that I came across people that you could call modern day adventurers. People like Jamie McDonald, who ran across Canada, alone and during the winter. Samuel Johnson, who unicycled 10,000 miles around the perimeter of Australia. And finally, Mark Beaumont, who back in 2008 had broken the record for the fastest person to ride a bicycle around the world. And his The Man Who Cycled the World documentary that I watched in one sitting when I probably should have been focusing more on revising for my final exams. These stories of going out on huge human power trips really inspired me to do something of my own. So naturally, I googled to see if anyone had ever unicycled around the world. After some digging, I discovered that, yeah, in fact, one guy had done it back in the 70s. Wally Watts, or Wobbling Wally Watts, as the newspapers like to call him, rode a custom 43-inch unicycle 10,500 miles around the planet back in 1978. He started in New York City, flew to Scotland, and then pedaled east to Turkey. He unfortunately broke his arm near Ankara, so travelled by train to India, cycled through Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, and then finally the States, where over two years later, he arrived back in New York. His sounded like an absolutely incredible trip, but the ride was unfortunately never certified by Guinness World Records. Whether that was for lack of documentation or because it didn't meet certain requirements, I didn't know, but it meant the official unicycling around the world record was still available. So I decided to give it a crack. I contacted Guinness to find out exactly what was required to set this record officially. They provided me with a list of rules which I tailored my plans to follow. I'll summarize these rules now. Number one, start and finish points must be in the same location. So I'll be starting and finishing at School of Bags HQ, so there's no issue there. Number two, the journey should be continual and in one direction. Fine, I'll be going east. Uh, the minimum distance traveled by unicycle should be 18,000 miles, okay? And the distance traveled in total, including boats and planes between continents, that kind of stuff, should exceed the equator's length. Number four, when crossing oceans or other impassable barriers, uh, the participant may only use public transports, okay? Number five, the participant must pass through two antipodal points during the attempt. So antipodal points, if you don't know, are points on the globe which are exactly opposite. Um, and I found out that an, ex an accepted one is between Madrid and Auckland uh, in New Zealand. So I plan to use that one. And number six, the participant should not remain stationary for more than 14 days. And this is the one ultimately I had big issues with. And I'll explain that after this week's sponsor. Surfshark is a VPN app and browser extension that lets you change your IP address in order to unblock content and websites that you otherwise wouldn't be able to access. It also adds an extra layer of security to help keep your passwords and personal data safe. But you almost certainly already knew that, because come on, you're on YouTube and you see ads for VPNs all the time. So why get Surfshark over any other? First off, they're offering a very good deal at the moment. So if you use my code EDPRATT, you'll get 85% off plus three extra months free which works out to just $1.77 per month. 
Secondly, you can use Surfshark to access the various different libraries of Netflix. Because if you didn't know, not all of their TV shows and movies are available in every country. For example, I recently enjoyed the Impossible Flight documentary, which follows the challenges faced by two pilots attempting to fly a solar-powered plane around the globe. This, unfortunately, is a US Netflix exclusive, but with Surfshark, I simply clicked into the New York location and watched it. And finally, they're the only VPN to offer the use of one account on an unlimited number of devices, which is pretty handy. So please use my code EDPRATT to nab 85% off and try it out for yourself. And by installing it through my link below, it actually supports the channel. So you receive a great deal, and it helps keep me producing videos. And if you decide, actually, this isn't for me, Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's really no risk to trying it out for yourself. The link is in the description below. Now back to the video. For eight months, I kept in line with Guinness's rules, pedaling across Europe, crossing through Istanbul and into Asia, cranking out the miles and always going east. But in Kazakhstan, things changed. It was winter, so the roads were very icy, and I ended up having an extremely close call with a car skidding towards me. These two cars just collided, and if that car wasn't there, I would have been hit. This event made me reevaluate the whole trip. The roads are dangerous, and I was almost hit, and that's scary. And while sitting in a nearby petrol station soon after it happened, I ultimately decided that pursuing a world record really wasn't worth my life, so I took a train out to Kyrgyzstan to wait out the winter. I ended up pausing the ride in Bishkek for six months, which is just a smidge longer than the 14 days Guinness stipulated. I went on to take multiple breaks longer than two weeks during the trip. Notably, Kunming in China over the Christmas New Year period, Bangkok in Thailand, and Cupertino in the States, where I spent about a month editing videos and prepping for the USA crossing. Also, because I was no longer following Guinness's rules, I decided not to hit the second antipodal point. I'd made it to one, Auckland, when I was in New Zealand, but instead of flying from New York to Portugal and riding home via Madrid like I'd originally planned, I decided that actually, I wanted the last few miles of my trip to be in my home country instead, so I never went. However, even though I didn't follow all of Guinness's regulations, I did employ one of my own that I stuck to religiously over the three years. That was, if I was on land, I could only make progress under my own power, i.e. unicycling or walking. After realizing early on that I was never gonna be able to cycle up every hill I came across, I was happy to allow myself to walk up steep sections of road. I suspect if I tally it all up with all the mountain passes and rough sections, I'd probably walk close to a thousand miles on the trip. The reason I think I employed this self-imposed rule was to keep myself motivated mentally when things got tough. I felt that if I allowed myself to skip a section, even for a couple of miles, it would ultimately undermine my desire to continue. So I take pride in knowing that apart from the watery bits, there's an unbroken unicycle tire track around the entire planet, which I think is pretty cool. So yeah, while discovering that a world unicycle tour hadn't officially ever been completed was the initial draw for me to attempt it, it certainly wasn't the reason I ended up dedicating three years of my life to see it through. I did it to see the world, and to challenge myself to find out exactly what I was capable of. This was my trip, and ultimately it didn't feel right letting an organisation like Guinness dictate how it was conducted. If I wanted to stop somewhere longer than 14 days, I felt like I should have the freedom to be able to do that. I conducted it in a way that stayed in line with my personal rules, and what I gained from those three years on the road means so much more to me than any official piece of paper ever could. And the fact that I stayed true to my rule, even when it would have been far, far easier to ignore it, means I can rest easy and feel satisfied with what I've achieved. I unicycled around the world. It's not official, it never will be, and I'm perfectly happy with that. So there we are. That's my story concerning the world record and why ultimately I chose not to pursue it. I decided to make this video first off to set the record straight, 
There are many articles out there that claim I was the first person to officially unicycle around the world. As I've explained, that is not true. In fact, nobody has ever officially done it. So if you're looking for an adventure after this lockdown is over and feel like you can jump through all of Guinness's hoops, why not give it a go? The other reason I made this video is because I wanted to shed some light on Wally Watts, the first person to unofficially unicycle around the world. I had the pleasure of jumping in a video call with him recently, and his story is truly fascinating. So please stick around for my next video to hear about the challenges he faced on his own world unicycle tour back in the 1970s. I did get stopped by the RCMP in Winnipeg, going across Canada, <clears throat> and that was a question, how fast to go? I said, well, I don't know. They said, give us your backpack and wait for us to go up. So they went ahead about a, a quarter of a mile. They set up the radar and they said, now go as fast as you can. And I went as fast as I could and I got up to 21 miles an hour. Hello, I hope you enjoyed watching this week's video about the world record. I um, don't know if you've noticed, but I'm back on the bicycle, which is great. Um, things have kind of relaxed a little bit here in Bishkek in the last couple of weeks. So we're allowed to go out riding again, which is lovely. So I'm gonna record the Patreon segment on the bike and I haven't done that for about a couple of months. I've been recording it from inside the apartment. So thank you very much, everyone who's supporting me on the third tier and you are Adam Wan, Alan Alley and Baby Bear, Annabelle Miley, IP, Alec and Theo Beer, uh, Campbell Daff, Damon Walker, Daniel Brom, Derek Donovan, Electric Unicycle Collective, uh, Elijah Legenda, Gaia de Navaya, Gary Hall, David Jolliffe, Jeff and Kelly Elder, James Wallace, uh, John Rothwell, Justin Lewis, Kiki Tedger, Malvin Zen, Mark Paris, Philip Merritt, Rebecca and Max Stegmaier, Richard and Martha Walker, Sam Richardson, uh, Sophie Vun, Stephen Jones, Neil Brooks, Tommy Nurmas Javi, Tomo Thomas, Travis Capita, Tristan Smith, uh, Warren Snyder, and finally Yoshi Chu. And thank you again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. So please use the promo code Ed Pratt to get 85% off and three extra months free. Um, the link is in the description. And I'll see you next time for the interview, the very exciting interview with Wally Watts. Thank you for watching. Woo!